You're here to listen to uh, Next Gen talk about TLS secrets, and so I will get out of your way. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Florent. I'm here to talk about TLS. Um, let me tell you how much of a surprise it is to me to file full room here. I mean, I was expecting literally three people. Cryptography is usually not what is attracting the crowds, you know, like. But I'm pleasantly surprised. So let's get into it. Um, today we're going to talk a lot about this. Uh, it wasn't actually intended. When I did submit my talk, uh, this wasn't on the news and this wasn't actually planned. But you'll see how it fits into it and I hope that this will help you will help me convince you that there is reasons to actually fix the few bugs I'm going to drop today. So without any more delays, let me introduce you to the plan. Well, nothing very exceptional here. It's really a standard black hat talk, four parts, introduction, lol cat, demo of the tool, conclusion. That's what you were expecting now. So let's start by who am I? Why I'm here? Um, then we'll talk a bit about um, SSL and TLS and what you need to know about it. This is unfortunately required so that we share the same vocabulary and, and we understand each other. Then I'll introduce forward secrecy. Uh, I hope most of you are familiar with the notion. Well, if you're not, I'll try to introduce to you why this matters. Then we'll start, I'll, I usually don't do that, but this time I'll make an exception. I'll read you part of an RFC. I don't know if many of you have actually read an RFC so far, but really you should because sometimes some of it is really funny. <laughs> so we'll start by that. And then once we've established that the standard is uh, incomplete, uh, broken or um, otherwise non-perfect, we'll look at the implementation of it because, you know, uh, in cryptography it's not only about how things are supposed to be, what really matters is how it's implemented and how it's used. Well, so we'll look at OpenSSL. Um, I should have arguably looked at other implementations but OpenSSL tends to be what everyone is using nowadays. So I think that by, ne by nailing that one down we'll have a good overview of what people are actually using in the wild. And then when we establish that OpenSSL is arguably non-perfect too and has also known problems, uh, we'll start looking at the applications because after all, you know, OpenSSL is just a library. It's up to the applications to do the right thing. That's what you would expect, right? Once I'm done talking about the applications, uh, I'll um, put my, um, we'll look through the prism and um, we'll try to find what the applications of what I'm talking about today uh, can be applied to something like Prism. Then I'll introduce you a tool which allows to do cool things and then I'll conclude. So everyone seems to be settled in. There is still a few room seats here if you want to come. Uh, without any further delay, let me move on. So who am I and why am I here? Well, my job is all about raising security awareness. That's what I do. I, I lead a small team uh, for a boutique shop across the town in London. Um, I, we do lots of interesting things. That's incident response, forensic, red team exercise. Really bespoke services. I'm also training people. I'm one of the few Tiger Scheme trainers. Uh, you've probably never heard about Tiger Scheme here on, on this side of the Atlantic. but I'm also one of the guys who is behind Freenet. For those of you who know what Freenet is, Freenet is, uh, who don't know what Freenet is, Freenet is a decentralized anonymous network whose goal is to provi provide a way for people to publish and retrieve information anonymously without having to fear censorship. 
And I'm also the guy uh, who last year got a Pony Award. You remember the F5 bug? Well, that was me. So, let's move on to SSL. Well, to talk about SSL, I really need to give you a bit of history and background about the protocol itself. So, what do you need to know about SSL? You need to know that SSL is actually a very old protocol. It's become the de facto standard today if you want to secure sessions on the internet. Everyone is using SSL and those who are not arguably should. Now, there is many versions of SSL. You'll see that the versions people use nowadays are SSL version 3 and TLS version 1. Um, the adoption of the more recent versions of the standards and subversion of the standards are not yet widespread. Browsers are starting to support these. Um, the first two versions of SSL are fully broken in so many ways that uh, it's not even funny. Um, the bottom line is that um, today you should be using TLS. Everyone refers to SSL but really what people mean is TLS, transport layer security. This is what you're using today. One version of it. So why is this slide? Well because I'm trying to, do you know what the main difference is in between SSL and TLS? What was the main evolution there? Any idea? No? No one? Um, no, it's not forward secrecy actually. Um, you were supposed to have forward secrecy and I'd argue during my talk that you had better forward secrecy using SSL than using TLS. Well the main, main evolution in between both is that TLS is extensible. There is extensions to it. SSL was a fixed format that you couldn't really extend and improve. Well TLS has a format for that where you can have optional extensions which allow you to enrich the protocol one way or another. So today I'm going to talk about one extension in particular which is specified in RFC 5077. So before we go in more details about that, I want to um, do a bit of myth busting here because I think it's required. Um, you know, I do security consultancy for a living and I still see people who don't use TLS. And the best, I mean, the reason I hear the most often is that TLS has a cost, a performance cost. Well, let me tell you that this doesn't exist. There is just no good, it's not a good reason not to be using TLS. I'll go in more details about that. Uh, the rational reasons why you would want to consider TLS being expensive can be summarized into two different points. One of them is that unshaking part, the unshaking part of the protocol is expensive because you have to do asymmetric cryptography. Past the unshaking part, it's symmetric cryptography. And in case you have users who are spread across the world, um, if you are on a high loss, a lossy network, you will have scenarios where uh, the cost of doing SSL is actually huge because if you start having packet loss, uh, you will introduce an incredible amount of latency. Frames, I mean packets basically need to uh, happen in order when you're using a security protocol and when you're using encryption. If they don't arrive in order, this is a problem and this means you'll have to retransmit and this will make you waste time. Volume doesn't matter and this is the point I'm trying to raise here. Um, my next slide is all about that. So why volume doesn't matter? Well because after the handshaking part, um, it's all symmetric encryption and the symmetric encryption um, is basically done using a cipher, usually a block cipher. Here on this graph I'm actually presenting you, um, this is a bit old by the way, uh, the performance on a single core of the different ciphers that you would most commonly use with SSL or TLS. As you can see you can do uh, with our hardware acceleration using ARC4 350 megabytes, yeah, megabytes per second on a single core. 
and this graph is old. Uh, if you start having hardware support and that's all the modern recent Intel processors so from i5 i5 something uh, this does 640 megabytes per second per core. You will hardly ever handle that kind of traffic. So no, don't argue that uh, crypto is expensive because that's just not true anymore. You can't afford it. So I did say that part of the cost is the performance of the handshake and there, there is unfortunately not much you can do about it. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Asymmetric cryptography, whichever way you stretch it, it's going to be expensive to some extent. It's also something you can't really optimize. Uh, there is different technologies that you can use. You can use RSA, DSA, CDSA. Um, but at the end of the day, it won't make much of a difference. This is always going to be the expensive part. One of the things you can optimize is the key size. But nowadays, it's already pretty much optimized. If you use an RSA 2048 bits key, this is really the minimum you should be comfortable using nowadays. If you use anything smaller than that, uh, you, you will have nasty surprises very soon. The solution is to handshake only once. Why? Well, if you look at most use case, I mean, the standard use case is a browser, right? You're handling a website, a high traffic website. Well, most browsers will have many parallel connections. And those parallel connections uh, are, can be reusing the same key material. If you teach your implementation and you tell the server that yes, I want to reuse key material. Well, there is actually a mechanism in SSL to do that. It's called session resumption. So how does session resumption work? The classical SSL handshake when you start without session resumption is a four way handshake as displayed here. So the, fl the, um, the flow starts by the client who sends a placket, a client hello, saying, hey, I'm a client, I'd like to handshake. Here is a list of ciphers I can support. Here is the options I know about. Uh, why don't you tell me what is acceptable to you? The server replies, bundling certificates, picking a cipher, the key is negotiated, and the server finalize the exchange. Small question here. Do you know why it's actually a four way handshake instead of a three way handshake? But, yeah, I mean, what would be the reason why you would not do it in three? Um, no, it's actually denial of service protection. You want the client to be com com computing and committing some a round trip before you do any expensive computation on the server side. This is usually why you go, I mean, most handshaking protocols, most crypto handshaking protocols are actually four way. So, how does it work? Well, without resumption, I'll give you an example. So, let me introduce you to the test bed here. I've got a VM running, and this VM runs a standard Apache server. Standard Apache server, which is configured to use SSL. Um, if I connect to it, this is what I do here. So guinea pig is my is an SSH connection to this virtual machine that you've seen here. I'll use that from now on because it's easier. Um, so if I connect locally, this is what I usually get using SSL. If I do a GET request, I get HTML back, which tells me that yes, this is working. <laughs> This is an HTTP server. Now, if I do a standard SSL connection and I specify a few options here, you can see different scenario, different things here. So one thing you can see is the version of the protocol I've negotiated. Turns out that here I've used TLS version one. This is a cipher which has been picked. And this is a session ID. What is the session ID useful for? Well, it's useful for the session resumption. And I'll show you just now how that works. The master key is the key which is used to derive all of the session keys. So, how does session resumption work? Well, after the first 
connection, when you have done the full four way handshake, you can actually tell the server, the server issues you a session ID that we've just seen. And you can actually tell the server, well, here is my session ID, why don't we reuse the same key material? And that allows you to basically transform the four way handshake into a three way handshake. Because the server already knows that you have committed to a round trip. You have key ma you have access to a session or to material that the server knows it has negotiated in the past. Let me illustrate that. So here I'm going to save I'm going to save the key material. So you can see that this time my session ID starts by FD and finish by 6B and my key material starts by 07 and finish by E2. Now I kill the session or I do a standard request. I've got a second request coming. I reuse the key material and the key material of my new session is exactly the same. Make sense? I can reconnect several times using the same key material and you will see that every single time I'll negotiate the same session by presenting the same session ID, the server, the, the client, by presenting the same session ID, the client will encourage the server to reuse the key material. So all of that is very nice and works very well. But people, you know, they always want to optimize. Can you, can you think about anything here which on the server side would potentially cause problems? Mem well, memory, I've heard it there. Um, memory, because each time you negotiate a new session, you need to have a cache where you store the key material. And what that implies is that each time a new client makes a new connection, a full four way handshake, you're going to use some memory up to store the key material associated with that session. So people decided to make it stateless. Stateless is what everyone does, right? So today most of my talk is about an extension of the protocol of TLS which is called session tickets. Session tickets are a blob of encrypted data with a secret which has been picked and chosen by the server which is handed over to the client and each time the client connects the client will present the same blob that the server will be able to decrypt because it has a key for that and that will contain the key material used in that specific session. Make sense? So obviously you know people are not always um, <laughs> this sounds very nice in, in theory. Now in practice uh, there is lots of room, lots of things which could go wrong. If there is one thing that I've seen people screw up in cryptography, it's key management. And sending your key material to the client every single time you make an exchange and sending it in clear because that's what you do. TLS is a declarative protocol where most of the signalization is actually done in clear text. I'll show you afterwards. I've got a few slides with Wireshark and we're going to go through an exchange. But most of the, each time you change key material, each time you renegotiate, each time you terminate a session, this is all information which is public. Each time you try to handshake to a server, the certificate goes in clear text. So the RFC does a good job at giving an example of how you could be implementing it. I, I won't read that in details but it basically specifies uh, what cipher you should be using, how you should be formatting the tickets. So there is a key name, there is an IV, there is the encrypted state, that's a blob of data and there is a MAC. This is how the RFC suggests you do it. What does it look like? Well let me show you what it looks like. I connect to the very same server but this time I'm removing the no ticket option. And I'm getting from the server a session ticket, which is that blob of encrypted data. Now, 
before I go any further, uh, you might be curious about this part. Uh, let me introduce you. I've slightly modified OpenSSL for the demo and to make it easier for you to understand uh, and see what is actually happening. I didn't feel like showing you hex dumps without any meaningful value. So here's how I've patched my OpenSSL. My OpenSSL is actually very flawed where instead of doing this which is generating three different random key of 128 bits, I'm actually hard coding all the values. So what that does is that my ticket name will always be A, my HMAC key will always be B and my ES key will always be C. And this is why when I connect here, I'll always get A. If you connect it to a normal server and a real server, it will also be always the same name, but the name would be random. Okay? So, what could possibly go wrong? Well, lots of things, and this is what my presentation is about. But before I introduce you to, to you what is actually wrong with it, I do need to talk about forward secrecy or forward security. So what is forward secrecy? Forward secrecy is the property which ensures that an attacker cannot decrypt a conversation even if he records the entire session and subsequently steals the associated long term secrets. In other words, it ensures that the session keys are not derivable from the information stored after the session concludes. It's a very important pr property. Most crypto systems should feature that property. Most don't. I've got a slide about that. So in practice, what does that mean? Are you familiar with, you know, in, in cryptography we usually use uh, a, a schema where Alice wants to talk to Bob and Mallory is a bad guy, wants to do something. And here, what does that mean? Well, what can Mallory do if an exchange is done with a crypto system which aims at doing forward secrecy? Well, with an active attack, it can do anything in any case. But with a passive attack, um, if PFS is in use, you shouldn't be able to recover the plain text, even if the keys and the certificates and whatnot have been compromised. So, what would you want forward secrecy? I've tried to put it in words, and I failed. So, here is my best guess. You know, XKCD. Well, this explains the very reason why you want forward secrecy. And this illustrates, when I'll introduce Prism and make some conjectures about that, why you would want forward secrecy everywhere. You can't be asked to produce something you don't have. So, where do you have no forward secrecy? And you should really have forward secrecy. Browsing the internet, and this is what my talk is about, and this is what I'm trying to fix here by raising awareness and hopefully getting you involved in the solution. In wireless, uh, today you're connected to a wireless network, or if you're wiser, you probably haven't, but uh, one of the things that you might not know about it is that everyone shared the same password, and that means that anyone who is passively listening to what has been exchanged as he knows the password, if he captured your four way handshake, he can recover the plain text. So it could have been an open network today that it would have been exactly the same thing. Now, cell phones. Cell phones also don't feature a forward secrecy. Everywhere. I mean, each time I look at a security protocol, it's very rare to see forward secrecy being used. And this is a shame, and this really needs to change. Why? isn't not used. Well, I'm going into that into this slide. Um, how do you get forward secrecy? I tried very hard to make my slides simple enough so that everyone can understand. So I've stripped all the math. All you need to know is that it's based on modular exponentiation, that construct. And that means it's expensive. So it increased the cost of the handshaking phase. And this diagram here shows you what the cost is for the client and the server depending on different configurations. The first one is a standard exchange 
without forward secrecy. The second one is what it used to be, where you were doing Diffie Hellman. And the third and the fourth one are when you use elliptic curve to do your exchange. As you can see, the cost used to be threefold. You increase the cost by three. And nowadays, if you do it on a 64 bit system with the right cipher and cho choice, it's basically only a 15% cost. And that's peanuts, or at least affordable. This is why nowadays every single new system being designed should feature forward secrecy. Cost is not so much of a problem anymore. So, now we reach the interesting part. Now we all share the same vocabulary and we hopefully understand each other. So, I can introduce you to the lolcats. That's what you guys were all waiting for, no? So, let's start by reading together a bit the RFC. Well, hold on. Actually, reading an RFC is really boring. So, I'm not going to read an RFC. I'm a security consultant. So, the first section, if you've never seen an RFC, an RFC has different sections at the beginning of it. So, this is the RFC. This is a table of content. And as you can see, this is actually standardized and it's the same in every single RFC. There's an introduction, there's terminology, there's a protocol, there's recommendations, and eventually there is a paragraph called security considerations. Well, that's usually the one I read, you know, I do security after all. So. And that's the one I want to give you a short read of. So it starts by saying, you know, I, I told you start off the start that what people screw up usually in cryptography is key management. And it turns out that there is a session a section about key management. So let's read it together because it's worth reading. A full description of the management of the keys used to protect the ticket is beyond the scope of this document. So there is a full internet standard which is suggesting something a bit crazy, let's face it, you know, you, you're going to spend CPU cycles negotiating securely a key and then you're going to take that key material, encrypt it in some unknown unspecified format and send that over in clear text to the client and tell him why don't you show me that every single time you connect. And the security consideration part of the standards says that the key management part is beyond the scope of the document and merely emits some recommendations on how it should be done. What could possibly go wrong? All the recommendations made here are very sensible. Uh, they're just not enough. Let's go into more details. But it's not like it stopped there. The next section is actually about the lifetime. There is a concept in cryptography uh, where, you know, you shouldn't be, the reason why you usually re key is because you don't want to be using over and over the same key material. At some point you should move on. It doesn't make sense otherwise. Well, guess what? The RFC specifies that it would be good if you were changing the key, but you really don't have to. Let me read the part which specify that. The ticket lifetime may be longer than the 24 hour lifetime recommended. May be longer. I'll let the implementation details up to your imagination. So, at this stage, I was just reading the RFC. The reason I started reading the RFC is because uh, I've seen a talk done by Nate at Root Labs here at Black Hat in 2010 where he was talking about a remote timing attack on OpenSSL and the practicality of them. And he did mention session tickets because one of the things he was concerned about is that there might be timing attack vectors on the HMAC verification of those se session tickets. So this is the reason why I started reading the RFC. And then he mentioned specifically OpenSSL saying that they had a problem. Well, for your information, they fixed the problem. Uh, they don't, they're not obviously vulnerable to a remote timing attack on the HMAC verification of the TLS tickets. But I still looked into OpenSSL to find that out. And this is where I found those bugs. So OpenSSL, what do they do? Tickets are enabled by default. As in, if you use the default SSL option set, 
you will have the option and the bit, the flag, so that tickets are actually set in every single session you make. It's encrypted using AES 128 bit. It's integrity protected using HMAC SHA2 with a 128 bit key, which is a bit weird because you would expect the key to be twice that length at least. And the keys are actually stored in a session context. And there is no rekeying. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that there is no point in using any fancier cipher than AES 128 bits. All you're going to do is waste CPU cycles. Let me rephrase that because I don't think that the message got through here. You are going to spend a huge amount of CPU cycles doing a fancy protocol negotiation with a very nice brand new shiny cipher. And then you're going to take that key material, encrypt it with AES 128 bit and send that back to the same medium in clear text. The bad guy is just going to decrypt your ticket. If you can break AES 128 bit and that's what you're worried about and this is why you're using a better cipher than that, well then you don't want to be using tickets. And obviously the side effect of all of that is that if you're expecting forward secrecy on your exchange and you've spend the CPU cycles required to do a DFM man exchange or DFM man you would expect a perfect forward secrecy interval which is better than the program flash time. You know, Apache servers they stay sometime on the internet for years. They stay up for years. And the key material is actually present in memory for years. So um, yeah, I'll just show you quickly what, how to read the cipher which is being negotiated. So here I'm connecting to the same server again, locally, and the cipher which has been negotiated is here. So I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you how to read that. Um, the first bit here is the type of key exchange which has been done. In this case, it's an EFL man. Uh, it's an elliptic curve DFM man exchange. RSA has been used to authenticate the DFM man exchange. And um, I've negotiated AES 256 bits as my stream, as my uh, block cipher, as my um, cipher to, um, to, attend, to, to do the symmetric encryption and encrypt the data. I use a GCM mode and this is the integrity protection hash function which is in use. So what I'm arguing is that despite my session being created with all those fancy modern ciphers and a modern protocol and everything else, in this case this blob here which has an opaque format is encrypted using AES 128 bit. And this the bad guy gets on the wire all the time. So, so far I've been talking about the standard, I've been talking about implementations of the standard in the form of libraries. But libraries as you know it are not everything. Libraries are just part of it where um, it's up to the applications really to be fixing that. So let's look at the applications. I've heard that all the cool kids nowadays use Nginx. So I started looking at the Nginx and guess what? Well, they don't do anything special. They use the default OpenSSL behavior, which is the broken behavior I've just talked about. So some people here are probably going to say, well, I'm not the new kid on the block and I, I still use Apache. So I've also looked into Apache. Apache, it's actually more interesting. They managed to make it worse. <laughs> so,
so before the before oh that went very fast. Before this specific version, uh, the PFS was a program's lifetime because Apache was using the OpenSSL default behavior. After this specific version, uh, the user is in charge of key management because you know that in the standard they couldn't be bothered at specifying how it should be handled. The library decided not to handle it. Sure, the application passes the responsibility onto the user. What could possibly go wrong? You know. Um, when you report that to the vendors, the vendors don't care. Uh, partially because um, if you take independently all the vulnerabilities I've talked about here, uh, whether it's um, the cipher which is always the same, whether uh, it's uh, the integrity protection mechanism which is inadequate, whether it's the CVSS score of it is zero because it's still crypto secure. It's not something you can break. And what is wonderful here is that I'll show you that there is practical implications to a set of CVSS zero bugs and if you put all the, all the thing together you'll end up with unexpected security properties. So what did, when I said that Apache actually made it worse, I, I, I feel like I can't leave you like that. I actually need to elaborate a bit on what I meant. So here it is. Um, they've introduced a directive called SSL session ticket key file. Before, you had no choice. You had to use tickets, whatever, regardless of what you do. Now you actually have a choice. You can specify this parameter and these parameters let you uh, specify a key file and they tell you how to generate the key file using DD, dev random and store it on disk. So even go further and specify the key file contains sensitive keying material and should be protected with a permission similar to those used for the certificate, so long term storage key. Well that just proves that they don't understand what session tickets are about. Session key tickets and their key material is not to be retained long term. The last thing you want to do is to store it on a file which is stored on presumably a forensically carvable medium. If I can dig out the key, the session key you've been negotiating out of the file system, then why are we using a different key at all? It doesn't make sense. Here, it's just a documentation bug. They could just fix it by saying to the user, you don't want that to be on a forensically carvable medium. Or they could change the behavior of the app, which arguably I think is a better idea because uh, my next slides are talking a bit about it. Who should be using session tickets and what, what were they intended for? And you will see that the use case for it is really, really small. So, so far we've been talking about browsers because browsers is everything, you know, everyone is using that nowadays and, and really um, there isn't much to say about it. So let's talk about cases where it actually matters. Are you all guys familiar with Tor? You know the anonymity network? The idea is that um, you can establish connection to a specific server by proxying your request across different relays, usually three of them, and those relays will have their own layer of encryption. Part of the encryption they do is using SSL and you should see it as an onion and each time you have different layer of encryption and you need to go to the core of the onion to be able to see the data. Well, Tor is affected too. What are the practical implications of that? Well, the PFS interval used to be um, how often Tor is very paranoid. It uses defensive coding. They're not actually using long term certificates like a standard HTTP server. They're rotating certificates every two hours. Every two hours, a Tor relay will change its long term keying material. This is more paranoia than anything else, but this is what they do. And that means that your PFS interval is two hours. 
unless there is an active attack. If there is an active attack, you can actually keep the circuit open. You can connect the relay, open the circuit, and that will hold, that will force the relay to retain the key material in memory. What do they do here? They do ref counting. They don't want every two hours to kill every single session which is active on the server. So in order not to keep it, if there is still a session which is connected and associated to it, they don't ditch the key material. Makes sense. But that leads to a practical attack where the relays and the list of relays is actually public. So if you plan on staging an attack against Tor, what you used to be able to do is connect to all the relays you plan on busting, establish a session to them, and a new session every two hours, and eventually bust the relay operator and do some forensics. And what that allows you to do is to recover the plain text out of every single transaction which has ever been made to it. So let, let me rewind a bit here because I'm not sure everyone understood what I'm talking about. So you've got those relays which handle many connections from different clients. And the attack involves you establishing a new session which is completely unrelated to the others. But the fact that you've established that session will force the relay to retain key material in memory. And if you are to bust the operator afterwards, you can decrypt every single session including the ones you haven't initiated because the server has retained the key material. You've just busted forward secrecy. One layer of the onion is gone, two to go. If you do that on enough relays and you bust a significant portion of the network, well, you will actually recover and do very advanced traffic analysis. This has been fixed, by the way, um, around a year ago, I think. So, this is, I suspect, the part everyone was waiting for. Really, when I submitted the talk, this no one was talking about it, and and I really failed at finding a use case or something I could use to convince you people that this matters. Well, I've been given the perfect, perfect example. So, this is a very bad slide where I'm trying to explain who is actually using session tickets. So you can see the name of a few websites and then you can see me attempting at resuming the sessions uh, from different IP addresses um, on those services. I'm not complete, it's not up to date. Uh, it has changed. I know that Twitter have fixed their stuff. But what I'm trying to show here is that there is very few people who actually use TLS session tickets properly. There is two mechanisms for resuming session. There is a legacy session IDs and there is a session tickets. Well in most cases people screw it up. People configure a shared session cache but they don't configure a shared session key for the tickets or they do the opposite. The bottom line is it hardly ever works. And the few cases where it does work, it's more luck than anything else. It's because the load balancer they use is doing sticky session association or something like that. And that just magically makes it work. So, what I'm trying to introduce here is that unless you're Facebook or Google, you probably don't have a use case for TLS session tickets. TLS session tickets were intended for low memory embedded type of devices handling a very large amount of clients and connections. Well, I've got a news to break. I mean, if you are handling a large amount of connections, you usually don't use a device which is embedded and limited in memory. Memory is cheap. So, the rest of the talk and the tool I'm going to release are all about how can you get the key material to decrypt those tickets. Because having it would be very comfortable in the case of PRISM. Can you think about it? I mean, doing SSL interception, active SSL termination, that's actually expensive because each time you want to introduce and, um, and see a session through, you will have to do SSL termination. That means two handshakes, one on each side. 
you really don't want to be doing that. Well here, that means you can almost decrypt at water speed what is coming through. So I'm doing a bit more conjectures about Prism and how it might work and how it might be improved. I've seen the keynote from the general saying that um, we were welcome and even invited uh, contributing IDs on how to improve it. Well, if you're not using that, you might want to consider using that. Uh, you should, to, Im to improve performance, you can be using this stuff. So how do you get your hands on the ticket and the key of the ticket? I've made different scenarios. I'll, I'm running low on time so I'll have to rush it through a bit. Um, how would someone go about stealing the secret used to encrypt the tickets? It really depends on who you are and what your capabilities are. If you're a government agency, you ask politely. The way of doing that nowadays, are, I've heard, is called national security letters. Uh, and should your request be politely declined, you, you've got other tools, you know, you've got prisms and magic Googles and, and whatnot. And, and I'm sure that will give you the key magically. Now, if you're not a government agency, because I understand that not everyone in the room here today is a government agency, uh, what you can do is ask one of your mates for his useless remote memory disclosure bugs. Odds are he's got plenty. And the reason he's got plenty is because these bugs are usually categorized as non exportable by security teams. And it's pretty much a must have if you want to do an export where you do code execution because all the memory anti corruption and mitigation, anti exploitation mitigation technologies nowadays rely on introducing alia and um, unpredictability. So you really usually need two bugs nowadays to expo exploit something properly. You need one bug which tries to help you line up the planets properly and you need one bug which helps you get your root shell. Here is a small <laughs> example from CVE details um, showing how hard it can possibly be to have one of those bugs. Well, we can't see it very well here. But what it says is that, let me zoom in. Uh, there is different columns and this is just for OpenSSL. The average program nowadays is linked against much more libraries than just OpenSSL. But let's look at OpenSSL itself. Uh, all the columns which say code execution, that means remote memory disclosure in any case. Overflow, that usually is a type of bug that you can also abuse to remotely disclose memory. Same thing about this column. The bottom line is that there is plenty of bugs and there is no shortage of bugs which allow you to do that. And if you don't have a mate doing exploitation, you must be law enforcement. Law enforcement doesn't have any friends doing that kind of things, right? So for them, this is what my tool does. They're usually the guys doing forensic work and my tool is about assisting you to recover the key from a forensic image. So without any further delay, I'll go through the demo. I don't actually have much time so I hope it will work. Um, the demo is not the important part of the talk. I'm here to raise awareness today. So here is what the demo is supposed to be doing in case I don't have time to finish it. Um, I'm using and abusing ptrace but really you don't have to use ptrace to extract the master encryption key from memory. And then um, decrypting the session tickets sent over the wire using the key I've just recovered from memory. And then using that, I'm feeding that to Wireshark and I'm recovering the plain text. So let's make a small demo or I'll actually, I don't have time, so I'll replay whatever I've already done. So to capture a dump and an image, um, you usually, you just look at the PID of the process and I use an, an existing tool which is called um, a stack and you give it a PID and you give it a file name and it dumps the memory of the process um, right. and it dumps the memory of the process into a directory. 
if you look at the directory, it creates uh, these are memory addresses and there is a mappings file. So if you look into it, um, in the mapping file, it will tell you which page is mapped where. Uh, in this case, what you're interested in is a heap because it turns out that the keys are actually stored on the heap. So if you go through it, you just do something like that. Um, and if you look for the key, right, that never works on the first try. Okay. Uh, well, this is why I've got a tool. <laughs> so I've I've written um, a small um, Python script that I'll release, uh, which allows you to do exactly that. So you take a dump, a memory dump, you give it uh, a ticket, which in this case I would have captured using Wireshark, um, and you extract the key out of it. And what the tool does is that uh, it scans that memory dump, it goes over all the files, and when it finds something which looks like an HMAC key, it tries to validate it. And whenever it validates it, it picks and extracts the keys. Make sense? <laughs> and I've got another tool um, which um, this time decrypts um, the ticket, so you give it the keys that you've just recovered. These are the two keys. And then you give it the ticket and you give it a memory image, uh, sorry, a dump actually. And what it creates for you is a wireshark.decrypt file. And that wireshark.decrypt file uh, contains the random session ID uh, which has been used by the client to establish the session and then uh, the master key. And that allows you to recover the plain text. I don't have, I unfortunately run low on time here. I, I don't have much time to go through it. But I'll release the tool anyway so you can play with it. Now you've understood what it does. So the conclusions and takeaway before you guys all leave, because this is the important part of the talk, is there is one thing you should remember is this is it. If you're an auditor, you should really not focus on 128 bits of security because that, that's, I mean anything above that is just completely nuttered by what I've just talked about. If you're a pen tester, you should learn SSL and you should learn how to abuse SSL. More often than not, when I do an assessment, um, I find random devices somewhere in the middle in between what I'm trying to assess and my target. Well, by abusing perfect forward secrecy and depending on whether the device does termination or not, you might be able to bypass completely a WAF or whatever is preventing you from working. And if you're an end user, you might want to disable session tickets. So in Burp, there is now settings for that, and the reason there is settings for that is because I filled in a feature request uh, to do exactly that, where now you can negotiate perfect forward secrecy, enable ciphers only, and if there is a device in the middle and it doesn't do SSL termination, then you will bypass it altogether. If you're a user and you use Firefox, there is an about settings ticket uh, option which allows you to set and to tell Firefox, no, I don't, thank you, I don't want session tickets, please don't send me handshakes with session tickets. These are my references and where I borrowed a uh, few nice uh, pictures and benchmarks for, from. If you have any questions, 